soccer fans, we hope you've got your cups filled with some tea because our cup of tea is ready to speak all things women's soccer with you. My name's Megan Warner and I'm joined by my co-hosts, Katie Goodman and Harley Ford. How are you guys doing today? I'm great. It's a beautiful day here in San Antonio and I'm just ready to talk some soccer. Yeah. Um, I'm feeling pretty good. I'm finally like figuring out my life again because I was just in Oklahoma as the officiant for a wedding. So yeah, <laughs> I've had good things going on. Wow. Yeah, We're yeah. But it's <laughs> <laughs> So oh, yeah, let's like there's a lot of hats. Let's start mm -hmm. off the show with the latest and greatest in women's soccer. Let's talk about the Olympics. Team GB qualified for the knockout stages after just two games. Super exciting for that. This morning they had a very tough test against Canada, finished 1-1, which meant Team GB goes through as the number one seed from Group E. So that's really excited. Everybody in Great Britain is going to be super buzzing about that. Um, yeah, well, you know, in terms of, you know, Megan, England's doing well for you, but the USA, I mean, I'm, I'm still trying to wrap it as best as I can, but um, it's definitely been a, a lackluster knockout stage for our ladies. Um, the 0-0 tie against Australia was definitely, um, I don't know, I think that, in a lot of ways, like more energy needs to be out in the field. I thought maybe we saw it with that 6-1 win over New Zealand, but again, Australia and Sweden are powerhouse teams. Um, and USA, I believe their next game is going to be against the Netherlands. And they beat them 2-0 last time they faced them. But you, I mean, it's very, very difficult to imagine like what kind of performance they're going to put out there with the, the lackluster, lack of energy that has been seen uh in the past like against australia australia held like 61 percent possession of that game so like something has to change i don't know i don't know i'm definitely I don't know. <laughs> i've been a powerhouse so far in the olympics mm -hmm. their goal scoring form is insane so team usa are definitely gonna have to step up the performance in order to compete and we know they can do it they just got to find it in them right right absolutely I'm wondering if it, you know, the time change doesn't have something to do with it. I mean, it's hard enough for us to wake up just to watch the games. Imagine playing full on in those games in Tokyo in the middle of the night. That that has to be hard. I'm sure that has something to do with it. But again, it, you just don't know. Um, so, uh, but with with that being said, Brazil and Zambia had a really good game. Um, Brazil finished um, top of the charts in that one with a 1-0 win over Zambia. But the player that everyone's actually talking about is Barbara Banda from Zambia. And it's because she scored back-to-back hat-tricks in both of their opening games, which is a huge record broken for the Olympics. Um, she's the first male and female to score three goals back in back-to-back -back games um, uh, at the Olympics. So that's really awesome. Um, she's clearly one of those standout players. And what's even crazier is one of her hat tricks came against New Zealand and they lost that game 10 to three. So, you know, I, I, this is something I, I tend to say on like even the UWS Weekly is that people complain about soccer not being a high scoring game and you know typically at this level it's not but uh can you imagine you know sitting 90 minutes and watching 13 goals that's got to be entertaining at the bare minimum and um it's really cool that you know she's uh showing up in that way and then um you know additionally zambia tied 4-4 with china so they're definitely a team to watch they're doing really well and um i think that's probably my favorite part about the olympic games is that there's always going to be records being broken. You know, there's always going to be faster times, higher jumps, whatever. Um, and so it's just really cool to see how the sport progresses. And um, yeah, yeah, so it was a good game. Very exciting. I wonder if, you know, somebody's going to pick her up in this summer transfer window because she's definitely been a standout player in this Olympics. And right. it's a great platform. You know, Zambia, I think this is their first time competing women's soccer in the Olympics. So incredible for her to achieve such amazing things. Yeah, but speaking yeah. of UWS, this past weekend, it was the national championship and it was crazy. It brought us everything that we have been excited about. This summer of soccer ended with a complete bang. So we'll take it back to Friday night where we had the semifinals. And the first matchup was between Midwest United and Connecticut Fusion. 
Both teams started out a little bit shaky. I feel like they were nerves were definitely clear. Feeling out, it was 0 0 at halftime. Good game. And then CT Fusion came out in the second half and got two goals in the space of about five minutes. Tori Sousa scored in the 62nd minute. And then Sousa crossed the ball and Chloe Landers finished it to put them up 2 0. And then we had late drama with Avery Lockwood getting one back in the 96th minute. But it was just a bit too late and Midwest United fell to the CT Fusion. So that was a really, really great game. I think a lot of people, including us on this show, had thoughts that it would be Midwest who were going to be in that final and potentially taking the championship. So Yeah, I definitely did. The number three seed. Yeah, but in a lot of ways, um, I'm happy that it was Connecticut because, you know, I was rooting so hard for FC Buffalo. And the fact that they got beat by the team that went all the way, like, <laughs> mm-hmm. like I think that yeah. it makes me feel a little bit better. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I kind of had Midwest in my sights as well. I, I was like, oh, I'm going to call that game. But man, to come into the second half and to score two goals that close together, that's impressive. I mean, you know, sometimes all you need is a break to kind of regroup and it's a total game changer. So, um, Unfortunately for us, the San Antonio Athenians, that was not the case. <laughs> um, it was an interesting game to watch. I mean, there's no doubt, Santa Cruz, that you guys, you guys are good. And um, just the way that your back line, the way your outside mids were moving, um, the way you're able to draw on our defenders, get behind the back line, um, it was not something that we were going to be able to adjust to without having a break to kind of talk about what is happening with the structure, where are they getting in and behind. Um, And then not only that, you guys just have every single one of your players is a good player. And that's something that we talked about um, after the game. And even at halftime, uh, we we, we already we knew we were going to be up against um, another really tough 45 minutes after that half. and, you know, because, you know, it was seven minutes in when Giselle Thompson, who's only 15 years old, she's a freshman in high school, she scored on us. So it was a little bit of a burn, but also, I mean, that girl is fast. That girl is really fast. And it was a well-deserved goal. Um, on top of that, 17 minutes in, Lana Solano hit another goal. And then 39 minutes in, Alyssa Thompson, another high school sophomore, sister of Giselle Thompson, um, scored another three, uh, a third goal. And, um, also just so you guys know, she's the Gatorade national player of the year. Um, and then in the 84th minute, it was the player that I said we were going to need to watch, um, throughout the whole time during the UWS, Angie Escobar. She kind of put the nail in the coffin in that second half. Um, so, you know, again, it was a good game. It was, um, interesting to watch we learned a lot about ourselves a lot about the things we needed to work on but honestly it was a well-earned win um by the blue heat and you know it doesn't surprise me one bit that they took they took it all the way i think um we knew that going into this game this was going to be like the fight for the title for us and um we just we just couldn't hang, and so, anyways, I, it, it did make us feel a little bit better knowing you guys have a really stacked team. You're really good. You just like so many great quality players, even on the bench. And then also, you went into went on to play CT Fusion, you know, which I'll let Harley elaborate on a little bit. Um, so yeah. I, I'm glad you guys took it all the way. Yeah. Oh man, I mean, talk about that final. I think the I think we they knew exactly what they wanted to do, and they did it. I mean, shout out to CT Fusion for trying to, you know, reconcile the powerhouse that is Blue Heat. But, um, I mean, it was a it was a five zero game that, like, it was just that was without a doubt a way to to make your mark on both like the league itself and then also in the world of soccer. Um, I mean, Lena Solano she scored two goals. Like, that was something that you experienced with the San Antonio Athenians. Like she got in the back of the net there. She got in the back of the net again twice for the Blue Heat. Um, we had Angie Escobar score. Uh, Sadie Ademilican, Ad- she scored in the 48th minute. And then also Iris Rebbett scored in the 81st minute. So it was a 5-0 game. Like every single player on that team was tactical and aware of, of the mission. And they all performed to the highest expectations. I think it would have been nice to see Connecticut try and get one goal in the back of the net to at least, you know, say like, hey, 
we are here for a reason, trust us on this one. But I mean, it's without a doubt that the Blue Heat are a powerhouse. In a lot of ways, like behind the scenes, we talk about they are honestly an NWSL caliber team. And I think that goes to show like, what the UWS is capable of bringing. Like that is a level of competition where these players are so dynamic. They're so talented. And um, we have the pleasure of actually um, uh, bringing one of them into our own studio today. Um, we have a player from the SE, uh, SC Blue Heat, and that would be Lauren Hesselman. Yeah, after a fantastic season, it was only right that we brought to you a national championship player, the captain of SC Blue Heat. Joining us today, she's also an Olympic medalist, former Canadian international star, growing up in Green Bay, Wisconsin, attending Purdue University, where she set all kinds of records um, and was also named to the first team All Big Ten in 2003 and 2005. And then after her collegiate career, went on to play professionally for a variety of different clubs, including um, being drafted into the NWSL that was formed in 2013. So an absolutely incredible career. In 2017, she joined the Blue Heat and Blue Heat had won the inaugural inaugural national championship in 2016. And they have just claimed their second national title. We are super excited to bring to you Lauren Sesselman. Hi guys. What's up? Hello, Lauren, how are you? Hello. I'm great. I'm feeling awesome. Um, thanks for, so much for having me today. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So how does it feel to have won the whole thing? Like you just beat everybody. What does it feel like? <laughs> you know, it feels great. It's been, you know, ever since the beginning of this season, I'm just, you know, coming into this club. I have so much fun with um, Blue Heat. I've been playing with them for three seasons. And, you know, we just have such an exceptional team. And coming into this season, we were just ready to have some fun and to win it. You know, Carlos put so much work into this team. And um, we had such a great group of girls this this year. And so, you know, winning the um, conference champions was amazing. And coming to Austin this past weekend um, was something that was really special and just competing and, you know, playing some good soccer. We had so much fun together and I'm just proud of each and every player on this team. Yeah, it must have just been an incredible weekend. Guys. What were your thoughts and feelings going into those matches? You know, you've got so much experience. Do you still get nervous for these big games? And what about the younger players? How do you help them in coming up against some huge teams in such a big stage? Yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of these girls have such great heads on their shoulders. And, you know, they play at some of the top collegiate programs. And so um, mentally, they they were just so excited and so ready. And um so that was really cool to see, you know, going into this weekend, I knew it was going to be, it was going to be a, a hard task, you know, playing against both teams. We didn't know too much about both teams, but I watched a lot of game film on, on, on both of them, you know, being the captain, I feel like find it my duty to watch a lot of game film and just to kind of like help the girls and just be a really strong leader on the field. And so going into it, we knew it was going to be, it was going to be tough. And, you know, the first game against San Antonio was a great, was a great game. We had a lot of fun and, um, you know, we came out on top in that game and then we knew going into the championship, you know, watching Connecticut prior to our game, they were a lot taller than us, a lot bigger than us. And they just looked really great. And, you know, scoring two beautiful goals, that volley that I saw, I was like, okay, this is going to be a really tough task if we win this game first and foremost. And then going into Sunday prepping for that, um, we knew it was going to be a battle. And so we were just really excited to step up to the plate and just to just to have fun and just to do what we could do and go out there and score some goals. And, you know, you, as you could tell from the first 30 minutes before the water break, it was it was a battle back and forth. You know, I was I was going head to head with the number nine up there, having a good time with her. And, um, you know, Connecticut really brought it to us. And then, you know, then we started scoring goals. I knew once we got the first one, um, we were just our team was going to settle down a little bit more and then score some more goals and. Um, it was a fun game. It was hot. Oh my gosh. It was so hot. Like, I didn't know how I was going to be after Friday's game because I was just, I was so drained, but, um, you know, and then playing at 11 AM, it was already felt like it was 300 degrees out there, but, um, we made it through. So I'm really proud of the girls. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, it was different going from yeah. evening kickoff. You guys had the cool matchup on Friday night and then it was in that brutal heat on Sunday. So that definitely was something to take into consideration. 
I haven't you know, been in that kind of heat since I was with the Houston Dash. And so, um, <laughs> yeah, so Texas. Like, Whoa. <laughs> yeah. You know, the, us Texas girls, we were curious about, about that because we know it's hot in California, but we don't know how hot, you know. So we're like, are like, what is this going to look like for them? <laughs> so, well, also, um, yeah, I that's, think, that's too, is, like, we're lucky that we play where we play in Santa Clarita. It gets super hot. And then on turf, adding to that, it's, like, 200 oh. million degrees. So I think yeah. that kind of helped us a little bit. Yeah. But also, we have, like, these little okay. youngsters that can just run for days and never be tired. So <laughs> I'm like, must be nice. I'm about to be 38, so I'm feeling old. And I got these 17 oh my God. Yeah, these oh seventeen year olds that are just running circles around everybody. So I, I remember girl, the, the girl. forward on Connecticut was like, Wow, those girls are fast. And I was like, I'm so glad they're on our teams. I do not want to defend them. <laughs> yeah. That oh my god, like it's so funny that you say that. I'm thirty one, so you're over here inspiring the heck out of me. So good job hanging in there because you know, we have some seventeen year olds on our team and I'm just like I feel like my muscles and my bones don't feel the same yeah. <laughs> as they used to. You know, it's yes. just there's so much maintenance involved. Um, but yeah, that's that's funny. That's funny. Yeah, I think it's a great <laughs> conversation to lead us into our next question, um, which is about fatigue or um, advantages and disadvantages going into this match. So you guys only had six matches leading up to the national championship, while Connecticut they had ten matches. So do you think that maybe there was um, some advantage in not having played as much leading up to this final game? Like, do you feel that your body maybe was, you know, a little bit fresher to step on that field? Or, you know, how did you no, feel about that? I don't, I don't think so, because even though the, the weeks that we didn't have games, we were playing, like, scrimmages and stuff like that, mm -hmm. and the girls had been training nonstop um, for their college seasons. So everyone is, was, has been training a lot. So I actually think that Connecticut would have more an advantage playing more games and because we weren't really playing and practicing together that much. And right. it kind of messed up with the whole Canadian situation. So we would have had all those games, but with the border control and everything that's going on with COVID, it was really difficult. So then they added two more games um, for before we went to the national championship. So I think that if anything, Connecticut probably had more game fitness than us getting prepared but um the girls have been training really really hard so they were doing like two a days every day so um but yeah <laughs> yeah the, these girls are crazy i don't remember doing that when i was in college um so <laughs> yeah i mean you never know yeah. you never know so i think that connecticut really looked like they had been a team for a while and what happened with us is we actually lost a lot of players going into this weekend. So if you notice, we had some center backs playing midfielders that's never played there before. So we kind of were yeah, mixing going back to college. So. Yeah, a lot of people were going back to college. Mm -hmm. A lot of people um, decided just to not go to the national championship. We had a lot of things happen that many people don't know about right before. So it was kind of a whirlwind. So we yeah. were kind of like, we have no idea how we're going to do. So we had, so we even added some more youngsters um that have been training with us at the end and but never a doubt in my mind did I think that um you know we weren't going to give it all we got and you know what you said something before Harley and I was like yes I am not getting scored on in the back line when you said it would have been nice for them to score a goal and I was like no I think only yeah. Megan saw me I was like no I was like I pride myself no. leaving that back line of I don't know if you guys were watching the game but the whole time I was like no goals no goals we're not getting scored on <laughs> I know. The, I feel like the yeah. Athenians had some close chances in that Friday they night. They did. Pass. They did. You're probably like, no, we cannot let this happen. I just I'm saw like, you change oh. when Holly was saying, it would have been nice for Fusion to score. And you're yeah. like, no. No. Guys, I no. thought I was going to develop a stomach ulcer over there on the bench. I, I just <laughs> totally benched the whole game. But I was like, I'm about to get a stomach ulcer. Like, we're so close, but we're so not. Like, Yeah, oh, you guys had on. some good shots. Yeah. yeah. But your your plane was also delayed, wasn't it? So like you guys had just gotten in apparently. So like at first you're like, well maybe there's a chance, <laughs> but now now it's like, oh gosh, and they still okay. won. Uh, yeah, we had. Yeah. I don't know why we have we fly the day of games because my old body can't handle that because with my knee surgery and stuff. But you oh, know what? Yeah. We we always make it work and whatever the outcome is, and you know, so it was a good it was yeah. a good fought game, Katie. Good job. <laughs> oh, well, 
I'll let the girls know if they're not watching. I'll let them know. But thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Olympic and, player yeah, says you guys did a yeah. good job. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and that, that's really, that's the really cool thing too about um, what I love about this league, you know, is that everybody, it's like, we're all trying to build each other up. Mm -hmm. There's not really like this hatred or this nastiness for the most part, maybe, maybe in some extreme rival cases, but for the most part, it's such, there's such a good group of players that you just want to see what happens for people um, after the league. And, you know, um, you have like all of this experience, both in and WSL and everything. So just how does this atmosphere compare for you with like ver UWS versus, you know, the professional stage and like, are there qualities from the UWS that you feel are similar or that stand out to you? Or is there a difference in expectations, team chemistry, chemistry, like what, um, like what are some of the main similarities and differences that you notice having played in both leagues? Yeah, I mean, I think just the the competitive nature, I think, number one, um, I just seen these players step onto the field and, and give it all they got. And and um, just that competitive edge that everyone, you know, brings to the table, each team that steps out in the field, it's like, we're going to win this game. And that's definitely the number one thing. I mean, the league has done a great job, you know, really trying to put forth women's soccer and to really grow this this league and um you know who knows what's going to happen next year with this new league that they're talking about um and there's so many things you know obviously in the nwsl we play more games and we're we're training a lot more um and stuff like that but i think that this is such a great league to a great stepping stone for a lot of players that want to get to that level because there's so much talent in this league like there's so many like i'm a sports agent now so like there's so many girls that we played okay. against that i'm like oh i would sign her or I want to see her go pro. And even like the last couple of years, me, I would pull some girls aside on other teams and be like, look, because a lot of them, we don't have a lot of mentors, right? We don't have a lot of people helping us with the journey. And those people want to go and play, but they don't know how to do this. If they went to like a smaller school or they just didn't get noticed. So I'd pull players aside and be like, you are a great player. Like, don't, don't stop. If you, if you want to keep playing, like do this and, and stuff like that. So I've seen so much talent and you're going to be seeing a lot of these faces coming up um yeah. in the nwsl playing overseas you know even some of the players on our team national team um so i think it's 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 pretty special to see that so that's incredible you know and i can imagine your team must also love having you as a resource and you know on our team i've also had girls ask me like what do you do how do you get there i'm like actually i have no idea i have no <laughs> idea how you get there so I'm well, gonna send they need them help. your way. Yeah, yeah. I got cool. you. <laughs> good, good. I'll send them your way and let them know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm right. sure that's such an incredible asset that you can bring to Blue Heat, particularly when you're training with younger players and just guiding them through it. We would all love to know how did you come across Blue Heat? Uh, like, how did did you get recruited by them? Like, how did you find this team? That's a good question. Um, I have a lot of concussions, so I don't really remember. <laughs> um, Honestly, me too. Did you see, like, in the games, I really had the ball now, yeah, because of that. But um, honestly, I, I don't really remember. I think maybe Carlos just reached out to me when he saw that I moved. Because I moved to L.A. after I was done playing to start in the entertainment business. And um, I think that I was just training with somebody and someone was, like, suggested, oh, you should play in the EWS if you still have, like, the passion to play. And then I don't know if I reached out to Carlos, so he reached out to me and it kind of just worked that he was like, oh, come play for this team. And I don't really know much about it. Um, and so then I just went out there and I was like, oh, this is so fun. And so for me, at, you know, every year I'm always like, as I keep getting older, I'm like, should I keep playing? But I still have so much like fun, you know, and it's just such a joy to be competitive. So um, and Carlos is really he brings together such amazing players from all over the world. I mean, our number six was from France. So, you know, we have, yeah, we have some great, um, uh, right, Carlos. Players. Yeah. <laughs> like he's, he knows where to find the good players and it's very impressive to me. And so for me, as somebody who is in that, um, in the field of mentoring now and being a, an agent and stuff like that, to be able to give back everything that I've learned and, you know, you know, inspire these girls is pretty rewarding. And I mean, I'm going to play with. Oh, I think we lost sound, Lauren. What happened? 
Oh, oh, you're back. There we go. No, sorry, you guys. I don't, <laughs> oh, I don't yeah. know what happened. That was weird. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it so it's, okay. just been, it's been fun. Yeah, so talking about that, you know, um, you have like such a wide generation of players on your team. You know, you have you have girls in their early teens, you have girls in their later years of soccer. Um, Megan and I, the team that we play on, we have girls who are as young as 15 and girls as old as like, I think she's 46. Um, oh, wow. So, Someone yeah, has yeah. To <laughs> <laughs> trust me, trust me. And I think that's something that's really mm -hmm. unique about the UWS and um, is that there is such a wide generation of players that get to come together. So, you know, part of like, having that um, wide, wide range of experience and then also just the, the culture of SC Blue Heat. What is it like playing for that team? And do you think that having this wide generation of players strengthens your organization? Yeah, Matt, it strengthens the organization, but also just strengthens the game in general um, to be able to see like the, how much the sport has grown between these players, like playing with these girls that young. And I was like, man, if only I had that talent at that age, or I did things that way at that age. And, and now to be able to see them and help them, you know, when I was going up through the process, as I said, no one was there to help me. No one was there to, to help me get sponsorships and do all this stuff. Now these girls can all get that stuff. Um, and just to see them grow on and off the field, is going to be really special for the sport as a whole. Um, and, you know, it's going to be really exciting to see these these youngsters, you know, that are up and coming because you're going to be seeing all of them, I think, in the national and um, pro stage one day. So um, just to have that wide variety, it just adds so many different elements to the team. You know, as I say, it's always a puzzle, right? We're each a piece of the puzzle I and mean, we bring a different element to the table. So, you know, these youngsters, they're they're learning. They're learning a lot at that age that I wish I would have learned at that age. Um, so well, it's pretty cool. Lauren, I can relate to you so much on that, you know, especially like I, my team also has a couple 17 year olds and I'm just thinking, my goodness, if I was that fast or if I had that, <laughs> you know, tactical, technical knowledge of soccer, like, man, things would be different. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it is incredible that, you know, that they get to kind of be center stage um, in the summer league. But, you know, I want to know what your thoughts are for, you know, like what your thoughts are on the league and um, if you think that there is like what other ways that players can prepare for the next level? Like, do you think this is a good step? And then what do you think um, would be the best step next step after that? You know, so coming out of college, like obviously you see like on our teams and stuff like that, we have a lot of college players. I think actually our team had the most college players. Someone told me that. There was not a lot of the other teams had college players, which I didn't realize. Um, and then a lot of girls after college have been playing too, because they're kind of in that in between phase of they want to play, but don't really know how to get to that level. So the league has been a really good stepping stone and a good platform for people to really like showcase them. So, you know, I've taken a lot of the girls and I'm like, okay, well, this is how you should, because a lot of the recruiting right now is going on social media because with COVID and everything, right agents uh, pro coaches are recruiting within social media so i'm telling all these girls you know clean up your social medias your instagrams use it as a tool to kind of elevate your career right so put your highlight reels on there showcase right. your skills um promote yourself in a positive light so that when these people see your page they see how serious you are you know and how professional you are um that's the number one thing for players that want to play pro is is the level of professionalism i've seen a couple girls just quit because they weren't playing and, and that's not going to fly you know so um yeah just things like that yeah just things like that yeah yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely it's one of those it, it, especially when you go on to like higher league soccer i can imagine like you just have to be okay with you know fighting it out a little bit early on you know mm -hmm. it's it's very rare when someone just walks onto a pro team and is a starter and has all this time, I can imagine. So, yeah, yeah. thank you for that insight. Um, you know, just that clip alone, I feel like I need to send to my entire team. <laughs> so that's that's good please stuff. Please watch this, please. Yes, if they need anything. Yeah, just watch this episode, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and speaking yeah. of, like, your career, like, you have been on every level of soccer. Like, you have played – um, I mean, in some ways, you can consider UWS like a grassroots league, but you've also seen the national stage. And so you've seen, like, from birth to, to where we are today, 
of like the growth of women's soccer. So what does that mean to you? Like seeing that it's not not just something that is kind of like laughed about or like, ah, you know, yeah. girls playing soccer. Like why, what does that growth mean to you? And what would you like to see for the future of women's soccer? You know, it means the absolute world to me because, you know, as I said before, when we were up and coming, we got really no support. Um, people just didn't really care about us. We didn't, we didn't have a lot of eyeballs on us. And then as my career um, went, we were getting more and more. And it's just all of us standing up for each other and helping us and, and being each other's cheerleaders. You saw, especially over COVID, a lot of female athletes from across the, from all sports, just banding together, promoting each other. So I think it's just, you know, that, you know, more eyeballs watching us, you know, there, we've gotten a lot of um, more fans in general watching all the games. And I think, you know, the success of the U S national team is, is helped tremendously as well. And just the ex success of other countries around the world, just growing the game and like, you know, getting national teams, you know, fighting for themselves. Girls are finding their women are finding their voice now. And I think that's really helped, you know, women's soccer in general, people are stepping up for what they believe. People are being more vocal about what we deserve. And I think it's gotten a lot more eyeballs on that. And so the game has just, you know, grown exponentially and it's just, it's continuing to grow. So I'm excited for the future. I mean, even like the pay has, has grown so much. So, um, you know, a lot of your youth players on your team, there's going to be more money for them and more opportunities for them. More teams are starting up. So, I mean, even just with, you know, the UWS league and in, in general, more teams and, and trying to add more of like a pro type league next year, things like that is just that people that are believing in this sport and believing in this, like all of our owners and stuff like that, all the people who are in the organization of the UWS, I think that's just really cool to see. And then just the fans, I mean, so many people that I didn't think would have maybe watched our game or wrote to me and they're like, that was such an awesome game. And yeah, you had like, watched the viewers for that. Yeah, they didn't even know what the EWS people. was. Right. Yeah. They didn't know what it was yeah. before. And so then they, 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 they followed our journey, you know, this, this summer of, of our, you know, um, how we played. And so it was just, it was just kind of eye opening, refreshing to see where the future of this game is going to go. So I'm excited. Yeah. For sure, that's and you're part of that. Like, yeah. yeah, you you are you are so unequivocally a part of that. You know, like yes. you've done so much for the game, and like you're still just doing so much for the game. So thank you thank for what you. you're bringing to it. Absolutely. You yeah. three as well. <laughs> this this just this podcast in general is is yeah. is amazing. You know, just to see three strong females talking about the beautiful game. I think it, it that play it as well. I think is is really special. So. Kudos to you as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Yes. Yes. We're definitely better together, you know? So the more we can help each other, the more the sport's going to progress. So, yep. yes. Thank you for your insight, everything. Thank you. Exactly. Um, actually, on a previous show of ours, we were talking about what's your position. And we kind of discussed whether, you know, there's a certain age that players should pick one position or is it okay to, like, say to your coach, hey, I don't want to play that position, put me in this one, I back myself in this one. And you played in college as a forward and then, you know, kind of transitioned into that defensive role and, you know, leading your team as a captain, as a defender. So what's your advice to anybody kind of going through that? Do you think it's important to stay flexible and how did you find going from forward to a defensive player? I think what you just said is, you know, telling the coach, I don't want to play that position. Never say that. Never yeah. say that. I've seen girls. I, I've i done combine camps where um, a coach came in, a pro coach came in and was like, I want to see that girl in this position. So I told the girl, hey, he wants to see you in this position. He's into you. And so she started there. She said, I don't want to play that position. So she started there and then moved back to her position. And he pulled me aside and said, I don't want her anymore. A player that's not coachable and not willing to try new yeah. things, coaches, you're gone. They won't They won't take right. you. It's very yeah. cutthroat, especially when you get to the pros. Um, did I want to play defense? No, but it kind of worked out in my favor. You know, I was playing center forward all the way up to my first three years in the pros. 
And then my first day at national team camp, I'm, you know, I'm hanging out next to Christine Sinclair, looking at her like this, like, oh my gosh, I'm <laughs> next to her, <laughs> bowing down. And then my coach, yeah. like, my coach is like, Cecilman. And I'm like, yeah. He's like, left back because I'm left footed. And I'm like, I'm going to get cut the first day of camp. You know, I finally get my chance after three years of bothering the national team to to bring me in and then I'm going to cut. And actually it worked out. I think I was always meant to be a defender because I, you know, there's that like school. I was just like tall and like to beat people up. So I guess it worked out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and being left footed actually really helps in your favor. So shout out to my lefties. Um, it's pretty awesome. But I think coaches like to see for coachable and be versatile. I think it's important to learn almost every position because that way you just kind of learn what they're, what they bring to the table and what they need to do and what their expectations are. I've seen a lot in this game of like some midfielders not really knowing what to do um, p positionally because they don't understand the other positions around them. So I think it's, it's really cool to see um, players play different positions and just try it out. And so that they're, if they ever find themselves in those positions, they'll succeed at it. So um, that is my piece of advice there. Always be a versatile player. And now got so I went from center forward to center back. So there you go. <laughs> there you go. Next up, goalkeeper. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. I, as much as I'd like to play every position, um, I started as a goalkeeper. And if I don't have to deal with that stress for the rest of my life, I will be playing. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you know what's so funny though is people never want to play defense. Because they think it's they think it's so easy and all this stuff. So then I'm like, okay, come play it. It's actually one of the mm -hmm. hardest positions to play because you literally have to be a leader. And if you don't talk or don't say anything, like everything breaks down. And stepping to the ball, knowing when to go back is, is very difficult. So it's people that have come back, they're like, okay, I don't want to play defense anymore. I, I trust you. <laughs> I'm like, there you yeah. go. Because <laughs> yeah, defenders okay. never get any respect. Yeah. Bro, I totally I, agree with that. I'm, I'm also a defender. A defender. Katie yeah. and I were defenders, like, we did yeah. that totally. And it's just, like, you know, yeah. we are the backbone of the team, you know? Like, yes. If we don't do our job, we're not winning the game. Like that's Exactly. Funny. And then if you mess up, it's your fault, too, of yeah. course. But what right. Oh, oh, <laughs> right. <laughs> Can I ask you, like, pressure. what is your favorite part of being a defender for me like I love that last second where someone's about to take this amazing shot and I can either like get in on like a very strong tackle or even like a slide tackle I'm just like no mm -mm, not today yeah. for you honey I yeah. love to slide tackle I'm sure you guys could tell so but good. I love to slide tackle <laughs> but I love getting in their their heads I don't I don't like talk smack or anything I just like anytime they're around me like I'll just like nudge them a little bit or they're gonna run across me <laughs> I'll like put my arm out to slow them down. I've learned a lot of tricks of the trade, like because I'm not very fast. And so I remember playing Canada and every time the girl was trying to run, I would step in front of her. She's like, is that illegal? Is that obstruction? And I'm like, no, it's called defense. Like this it's is how they teach you guys to play defense. So I was like trying to teach the younger players like, hey, like shield, like shielding the ball, like that's a huge thing for you guys. So there's like little things that defenders can do that that are legal that um, I think are important. <laughs> so I just love it. I love Great. making sure we don't get scored on. It's like yeah. the best feeling ever. It's so gratifying. It's the best. Like, yeah. oh my goodness. <laughs> Especially when you can shut somebody down, you know, when you're like, okay, like I'm just gonna shut them down every time. And then it's a trickle effect. And you know, you're right. We don't get them enough credit. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have this yeah. discussion. I'm I'm the typical attacking player, you know, best moment is when I'm either getting an assist or like scoring a goal. And these two are like, No, I wanna stop that. That's what yeah. like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yep. we have a couple of questions come in for you, Lauren. Um so I'll put them up on the screen. So what advice would you give to upcoming footballers who want to make it to a D one pro team like the Houston Dash? So maybe one simple piece of advice that you would give to them. I think first and foremost, leave the ego at the door. Ego at the door. Um, I think a lot of players that I've I've seen too at that level come in, they feel like entitled and that things should be given to them when it's an even playing field when you step out there. And I think the hard workers really prevail. And I think just being the all around professional is really what's going to get you to that next level and to make a team. So if you if you step onto the field, you're a leader, um, you're a great teammate, um, you're having fun with the game, you're listening, you're doing everything you can, you're aggressive, um, you're talking a lot in the field, 
that's the kind of stuff that coaches look for, how you, how you mold and gel with the team. Um, and, you know, so I think just going out there and working really hard is what's going to set you, you apart from a lot of other people. Never underestimate um, the aggressive, hardworking players. I think, you know, for me, I was never the best, but I always worked my, my butt off and, and your time will come. I think a lot of people get frustrated if it doesn't happen right away for them. Um, as I said, when I got to the pros, you know, had a great college season, got to the pros, played one minute my first year. So I went from play, barely playing for three years to to starting. So um, and then going to the Olympics. So you never know who's watching you. Um, so just just keep working hard no matter what you're doing. That would be my best piece of advice. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. Amazing. That's something that my dad is serious. You never know who's watching. Like there could be someone mm -hmm. in the stands who's like who can change your life. So I think that's a great piece of advice. Mm -hmm. Right. And opportunity comes to those who work hard for it. Just like you said, you only had one minute, three years goes by. Like if you have that diligence, if you have that grit, if you're willing to keep going, it'll come. It'll yes. come to you. So and you I can make it yes. the hardest 60 seconds of your life. <laughs> you can yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I almost yep. scored too, because I was playing forward. And I almost scored. It was like right on the line. I'm pretty oh. sure it was over, but yeah. <laughs> like if I had two minutes, two minutes, come yeah. on. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, those but are the won. things you don't forget. <laughs> but we won the, the WPS championship that year, and I feel okay. like I contributed from from in practice, so it was great. <laughs> nice. Nice. Yeah, it counts. You need those players pushing you in the practice field too, so you definitely played a part. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we also had a question come in from Unity. Were you able to have mm -hmm. a consistent 18 all season? This is with the Blue Heat. And did you have a lot of much, much turnover? Congratulations on the title. Thank you for that. And um, we had a pretty consistent, there was a lot of college players that were in and out. As you, as you saw, we lost one of our top players, you know, for the final, we didn't have Savannah. Um, so there, there was a lot, we had a big roster of players just because that happens. A lot of girls drop off, they go back to college early or they're not playing enough, um, things of that nature. But for the most part, we had the, the same back line, um, and then for the most part, the, the core of the team was consistent, but we did have a lot of turnover. And I think that's really hard um, to have that kind of turnover. And I think that happens a lot in this league, which I hope it doesn't happen, you know, in years to come. Just because there's so many, the coaches and the coaching staff, the owners, they put so much into this league. And for some players just to be like, I'm going to quit, like, it's, it's, it's just hard. It's hard to see. So it kind of makes me a little upset too. <laughs> yeah. no, and then it's hard sad. when, you know, when they go back to college like, and the I girls who don't go back don't to quite... college. Yeah. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Delay. Sorry. <laughs> um, I was, Sorry, I'm yeah. fine. I was just going to, I was just going to say it's hard for the girls that don't go back to college. Like, what do we do with our time now? Like, we'd like to keep playing with this team. And then next year, it's going to be a whole different team, all new chemistry. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, it would be cool to see something happen in the fall, maybe some sort of segue transition to just kind of keep things alive, you know. So mm -hmm. we'll see. Who yes. knows what could happen. And then <laughs> from my mom, how old were you when you became a Hi, Mom. Um, <laughs> well, so when I became pro, so I graduated from college. This is going to really age me in uh, 2006. And then the league had folded. So Mia Ham, yeah, Mia Ham, say, Era was Musa, had just folded before I graduated. And then, so I went and I played, um, I don't know if it was WPSL at the time, but because we didn't have the UWS, but it was like the highest, I think it was WPSL. Um, in Indiana and then worked until the league came back in, I think it was 2009. And so, and so I didn't start my pro career until 2009 because there I didn't have anybody tell me, Oh, you could go overseas. You could do this. Like I didn't have anybody to help me. I had no idea that I had those opportunities. Um, so I got a job and then I um, went to the combine and then I got drafted. So I was, I don't know how old I was. 24 maybe 24 and then I joined the national team when I was 26 27 so yeah I was 23 24 wow now, so interesting like you know for you the national team it wasn't like you 
came up doing camps U16, U17. It's just being diligent, working hard, and taking the opportunities when they come to you. And nowadays, we have more opportunities, you know, to play across the seas. Mm -hmm. The NWSL has now been such a strong league for such a long time. It's more established. But for you growing up, it was a little bit different. Yeah. And was that just like a dream come true for you, like getting drafted to like the national team and stuff? Like, did you think that that was something that it was even possible until like later in your soccer career? Like, or did you feel like that was always a goal for you? I mean, ever since I was young, you know, watching the 99ers, it was something I wanted to do. And I think it's important to say, because a lot of players don't realize this. Um, I've helped like a couple people get their citizenship if you have a parent or a grandparent that's from a different country, you can play for that country and get that citizenship. That's how I played for Canada. My father is from there. So I applied for my citizenship. And since I told them I was trying to make the national team, they rushed it. And then I proceeded to nag the national team like every couple of months and be like, hey, look at me. Like, I want to play for you guys. Thank Give me an opportunity. You. And I didn't yeah. get an opportunity until 2011 because when they got a new coach after the World Cup. But see, it it will happen. So it's important for the girls that are listening to that, that that is, you know, something that you can do. Um, but yeah, it was a goal to always play the, at the world stage. And I didn't know how I was going to get there, but, um, you know, I did everything, the, the youth system, ODP regionals, all that stuff. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's hard. And as I said, it's who sees you at that moment. Right. So when I went to an ODP camp, that's kind of where I got, I got noticed for college and, and things like that. And, um, because nobody recruited within Wisconsin, and so yeah. I think it, people are like, oh, I saw you at this tournament or this. And oh, like, OK, cool. So it's like whoever is listening right now, as I said, just keep working hard no matter where you're at. So, yeah, absolutely. Wow. It's incredibly Laura, inspiring. You were, you were chock full yeah. of awesome advice. You were just like, yes. a well <laughs> of wisdom. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, Thanks, absolutely. <laughs> Lauren, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. It's just been incredible to hear from you. We really appreciate it. And we know all of our viewers are just going to be in amazed at what you've told them and really fired up to continue playing and pursue their dreams. So thank you so much. Well, thank you guys for having me. And thank you for all that the three of you do. I, this is an amazing podcast. So keep up the great work. And I have to say, go Canada, go, because I see that Megan's for Great Britain and everyone else is for USA. <laughs> yeah. So I have to say, let's go Canada. But also don't sleep on Sweden. Sweden is kind of my team this 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 tournament. Don't sleep on them because they oh, are fun to watch. Yeah. They Oh, are they are dangerous. Yeah. yeah. So, um, mm -hmm. Sweden and Canada are my teams. And actually, Netherlands have been playing amazing as well. So. I was just going to say, I'm interested Thanks. to see how the U.S. holds up against the Netherlands. It's I like, know. I this have, has been a great oh, their high score. Excited. I have very little faith that the U.S. <laughs> will be able to hold their own. And I'm wearing okay, a jersey. Say, I'm wearing a jersey this. today. I shouldn't say this on live because, like, I respect <laughs> all of those girls, but um, so much. I love the U.S., the, the players, etc. But it would be amazing to see another country come in and just like, like to watch them play the Sweden game. I like, I love the U.S. I was rooting for them, but I love Sweden. And I think people underestimate them and to see them just come out and crush it, I think just is a testament to show you, you know, how big this game is growing. And, right. and so yeah, it's going to be a hard fought battle the rest of the tournament. So I want all the teams to do well. I mean, even Zambia, like, wow. Like, you know, just watching, it, it really brings tears to my eyes to see uh, such good soccer and, and and these players just working their butts off. So it's going to, it's anybody's game right now. So it's going to be entertaining. Absolutely. But thank you yeah. guys for having me. I could talk with you all day. So sorry. <laughs> oh, totally. <laughs> totally. <going>. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> awesome. Yep. Yes. Oh. Yeah, we love, right in Texas. love whenever there's a big tournament because women's soccer always just sees a huge surge of growth whenever we get to play in, in these national tournaments. And the level is absolutely incredible. So anytime people want to discuss it, us three are like, yes, let's go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we can talk it all day long. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. And congrats yeah. again. Day on our cup of tea. Yeah. We really hope you've enjoyed finding out Very the well latest greatest in women's soccer and hearing from Olympic medalist, former Canadian international, and SC Blue Heat defender, national champion, it could go on and on, it's Lauren Sexton. <laughs>
Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to UWS and UWS2 and also to Jonathan Ward to help us bring this show to you guys. And please follow us and subscribe down below. Thank you, everybody. Cheers. Bye, guys.